good evening everyone uh, thanks everyone for joining and for this webinar on data privacy certification preparation and uh, it's a continuation of yesterday's session uh, where we discussed on the CIPPE certification and uh, today we'll be discussing on the CIPM which is certified information privacy manager so we'll be discussing on CIPM the uh, today's session is on the preparation for data privacy certifications and focus of today's uh, session will be on certified information privacy manager and uh, so about infosec train so we established in 2016 and we are one of the finest security and technology training and consulting company uh, so we are happy to announce that we are the official training partner with iapp and uh, with this partnership we'll be able to provide all the official certifications from iapp which includes CIPPE, which is Certified Information Privacy Professional, and there are uh, four different variants to that, which is CIPPE Europe, and CIPPE US, CIP, uh, CIPPE Canada, and CIPPE Asia. And uh, these are four different variants, basically uh, targeting the specific uh, law of the land, uh, which is the GDPR of Europe, and uh, we have Canada specific PIBDA, and then we also have Asia variant and uh, and the us one which is focusing on the uh, regional laws so this is the first uh, uh, certification which we discussed yesterday which is cippe and there are two other certification which is cipm and cipd our focus area for today's uh, webinar will be on cipm and uh, infosec train has now partnered with the world leading information and data privacy organization iapp and uh, this uh, this gives us the opportunity to provide our audience with a few of the most on-demand certification which is presented here this is our trusted client some of the big names over there and uh, one important question like why infosec train uh, so we have certified and exp uh, experienced instructors including me and flexible modes of training access to the recorded session at any point of time you can go back to your own pace and uh, and revise the content post training completion we always support you with your queries and we are always there to help you out with exams so coming to the agenda uh, today we are uh, targeting on the cipm and uh, we'll be looking into all the 10 uh, chapters which is which is prescribed part of the curriculum of cipm and uh, we'll also look into the exam exam prep discussions and data privacy interview questions and a plan for preparing and clear CIPM inside two months. CIPM course materials. So the first chapter one, so just to make it very clear, uh, today's session will not be able to go in the entire depth of all the 10 chapters and uh, what we are going, we are going to give a precursor of what you can expect during our course. Okay. And uh, during the session, I'll try to give you overview about certain topics and uh, it it is making you understand what you will be expecting in the course and what are the contents at the overview you will be uh, you'll be able to understand during the uh, to, during the actual course which is planned later on so the first chapter is about introduction to privacy program management and uh, uh, just to uh, just to again recollect Today's session is on CIPM, which is Privacy Program Management. And yesterday was uh, CIPPE, which is Privacy Professional targeting the GDPR. And once you have GDPR uh, understanding, now we are moving towards how do you manage privacy poster of an organization? And the first and foremost is uh, understanding in, in any privacy program management is these key features, which is what is the responsibility of a privacy program manager? and uh, what are the accountability requirements which any privacy manager needs to fulfill for an organization and beyond laws and compliance what is your day-to-day -day responsibilities how do you how do you add value through privacy for an organization and uh, why does the organization needs a privacy program that uh, needs to be very clear and uh, privacy across the organization because uh, privacy is going to cut across multiple products and services where uh, the privacy requirements needs to be embedded and awareness alignment and involvement so in chapter one we are going to see uh, some of the fundamentals of privacy program management and uh, with that i thought we'll touch upon certain very important topics as a basics okay 
so a lot of people still have a question on what is privacy right privacy itself has variants okay privacy can be uh, about a data about a body and uh, sometimes it can be uh, specific to uh, specific to what you are dealing with right and uh, here we are more focused on data privacy and uh, the very definition of privacy itself is not defined anywhere and that is the reason uh, and the the speciality of privacy because you cannot confine what is privacy because the roots of privacy are coming from human rights international human rights and uh, it varies depends on the situation depends on the context of where we are referring privacy right uh, on a higher level just for everyone to understand what is privacy it's a right to be left alone and not intruding someone's personal and family life so the origins of these statements starts with your uh, united nations uh, convention on human rights where they uh, where they came up with all these uh, specific human rights related to data privacy and uh, that's all consequence of the second world war right and uh, uh, specific to data privacy it's it's a right of an individual to control and protect his personal data processed by an organization so this is our focus area for the entire course and we'll not be dealing any other uh, aspects of privacy so data privacy is what we are going to focus on the entire uh, capp and cipm perspective okay so uh, now the interesting question is what is data privacy and data protection sometimes uh, a lot of people uh, mistake the synonymous uh, between privacy and information security or privacy and protection but uh, there is definitely a lot of dif uh, differences and deviation although there is there they are a lot uh, they are interrelated in a lot of ways but they are two different concepts uh, so data privacy and protection uh, is often confused terminologies and as i said privacy uh, roots back from the uh, rights uh, human rights specifically and uh, and as i said uh, it originates from the laws and it originates from the core concepts of human right uh, so we were at data protection and data privacy terminologies as i said data protection is a key enabler for data privacy and in data protection we are more concerned in terms of how we how we will protect the data and ensure the confidentiality integrity and availability of the data but in data privacy we will go one step beyond it uh, we will be looking at why are we collecting this data and uh, what are we going to do with this data what are the rights and control that we are going to give to the data subject from whom we collected the data so this is how you actually explain data privacy concept to anyone so it is your data and how you have control over your data and how do you ensure that uh, you your control is being maintained by the uh, uh, as been ensured by the organization and the organization respects uh, your uh, your your value of the data right and that is that is a, a core concept of data privacy itself and uh, coming to privacy program management so privacy program management is is a whole uh, framework or a uh, 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 a method in terms of combining uh, a structured approach of combining projects into a framework and life cycle life cycle to protect the personal data and the rights of the individuals so uh, we have a lot of concepts embedded with data privacy and protection but uh, if you ask privacy program management it's nothing but a structured approach of how do you uh, embed privacy at uh, at the data life cycle right from the onset of collection uh, in terms of processing the data in terms of archiving it and in terms of deleting it or in terms of uh, uh, in terms of uh, disposing it completely and how do you embed uh, the data subject rights into this entire life cycle is all a uh, structured approach of privacy program management and it's one of the enabler to comply with legal and regulatory requirements meet the expectation of the client or customers while at the same time prevent and mitigate privacy risk so that's the sole objective of any privacy program management of organization so a clear differentiator is that you don't always look privacy uh, as a compliance perspective it is also one of the key enablers in terms of uh, uh, meeting the trust of the customer getting the uh, getting the customers uh, trust is one of the key objective of ensuring data privacy and that's going to be the differentiator between companies in next 10 years 
whoever is not respecting data privacy in their core concepts are definitely gonna get a lot of problems uh, losing customers trust and also getting the uh, uh, legal and regulatory penalties moving on what is a framework framework is a skeletal structure that is needed to support the uh, program management people who are familiar with the uh, framework like uh, cobert and uh, yeah. and other frameworks which are there available in the market essentially uh, uh, we'll use the same concept here and we will create a, a data privacy framework and uh, each organization privacy program framework will be created by analyzing its applicable laws the regulation and best practices that are tailored for the goals of each organization so creating a framework is completely depends on the law of the land in terms of the company's objective companies uh, uh companies practices and that is how you create an effective data privacy framework and privacy life cycle it is a series of stages of personal data passes through in any organization the privacy governance life cycle includes assess protect sustain and respond basically you are gonna uh you're gonna determine what is uh determine the personal data aspects in assess and you're gonna implement the controls to protect it and you're ensuring uh, the controls are protected and the rights are respected and sustained and then finally respond is your uh, if you if you come across any threat how do you respond so this is uh, this is how the cipm course is also uh, uh, is being sectioned and uh, the course is uh, actually divided into these four parts which is assess protect sustain and respond okay so these are general introduction i just wanted to uh, brief you about these aspects and you by uh, people who would have attended today's session uh, will now understand uh, sorry yesterday's session uh, would now understand how the uh, the course is completely different from what we studied yesterday uh, because yesterday's session was completely into gdpr uh, uh, focus which is into laws and regulation now we are moving into how do you protect uh, personal data in any organization without understanding CAPPE directly come to uh, coming to CAPM is going to be challenging because that's where we study what is a personal data sensitive personal data who is a controller who is a processor who is a joint controller so that's the uh, that's a key differentiator i've been telling to a lot of people a lot of people had this question CAPPE versus CIPM and i always give the same advice have your foundation very strong and that is done through uh, targeting CIPPE when you have gdpr uh, a, a strong basis then you can build on top of it with cipt and cipm so that's a natural progression that uh, that i always suggest to all the candidates who want to take up a career in data privacy so moving on uh, so done with the sort of uh, fundamentals or basics of privacy program management uh in general i uh, uh i wanted to introduce you uh, for the responsibility of privacy program manager again this is an interesting question a lot of people came up with this question yesterday like what will be my day-to-day -day responsibility what will be my work in any organization if i take up this particular career so this is even part of the curriculum as well right so your your job role will always start uh, from as a state for example if you are starting this program from scratch okay uh, then you need to understand the business landscape right and uh, understanding business landscape varies from sector to sector operations to operations right so every particular uh, sector has its own nuance of uh, operations right so in that case understanding the business landscape becomes very very important because uh, uh, general application of uh, a control will never be effective unless we understand the gravity of the operations that is there uh, different types of data are collected the data is processed in a different way to multiple sector for example uh, a school collects personal data of students versus a, a hospital collecting the sensitive personal data of uh, of uh, the patients have a different set of controls to be implemented the range of the range of sensitiveness is very high in a hospital so the amount of controls uh, which needs to be there has to be very high that is where you need to understand the sensitiveness of the operation that is the first step of any privacy program management to understand the as a state and understand the business uh, uh, understand the business landscape and there are different types of data that is dealt by any organization or entity it could be your customers data 
it could be the employees data and it could be your vendors data as well a lot of people don't uh, sometimes uh, uh, understand vendors data could also be a personal data right uh, if your organization having vendors then possibly their personal data is also collected some of the vendor management uh, services or vendor management uh, transactions you do their personal data is also brought into your system so you should be aware of all these nuances to have a effective privacy program management and the second important step is to identify your legal regulatory and contractual requirement this is a, a, a fulcrum and basis for any uh, uh, program management let it be information security or data privacy you need to have a thorough understanding of your uh, law of the land your regulatory requirement if you're uh, for example if you're uh, operating in a banking uh, in india you will have uh, your sebi and uh, you will have rbi requirements all these things comes part of a regulatory and contractual requirements again you will have contracts with different vendors from different uh, service providers all these contracts needs to be also respected and documented so these requirements will also become very effective and uh, the requirements needs to be monitored periodically and implemented and uh, that is where you will also understand one of the key responsibility whether the organization you're working is a controller or a processor or a joint controller so there are three different variants where you will take the roles for example i define i'm an entity and i define the purpose of collection as well as the ways and means of collection then i'm a controller of the data and a uh, good example is for example you are uh, uh, as a bank uh, bank i am asking the data of all my customers while uh, opening a ba bank account so i take up the role of a controller but uh, there are services within the bank and that can also work as a joint controller for example a credit card department is there the credit card department together with the savings account uh, savings bank uh, department jointly define the purposes they both become joint controllers so for the same purpose we have a card printing facility as a vendor and the vendor only works on the instruction given by the bank to just print the card but in this process there is a personal data being transferred to them and they work on that personal data they assume the role of a processor so this is how uh, a controller processor and a joint controller uh, the responsibilities have to be identified and it needs to be identified for uh, separately for each and every process for uh, instances some places you might play the role of joint controller in some instances you might play the role of a controller so that is where this understanding needs to be very clear and identified and documented so the next important step after identifying the requirements are performing the gap assessment and identifying the existing privacy risk so it's a gap assessment basically and uh, every gap assessment the idea is that uh, you will see your uh, legal regulatory and contractual requirements and see uh, whether we are complying at the current poster what are the gaps and then just document it so that gap assessment give, gives you a clear poster in terms of how do you plan the privacy program rollout as well as the controls needs to be that needs to be implemented the next step is that review update and develop enterprise privacy framework along with designing policies procedures and templates so once you done did your gap assessment and by then you would have understood either there is no policies or the policies are inadequate or they are not reviewed in a periodic fashion so all these are privacy risk and you need to address them by either creating the policies afresh or updating them and keeping it up to date and then finally reviewing it periodically and getting uh, getting it signed by the uh, appropriate authorities within the organization so this is the next important step and uh, then identifying the privacy organization structure again a very important uh, point because without resources without having organization structure managing this complex data privacy issues will never be feasible because you are going to have uh, uh, the the concerns coming from different corners one uh, data subject can be raising an issue which is your data subject rights which needs to be fulfilled within a period of time for example within uh, if you are work if you are operating in european union region it needs to be it, it needs to be responded uh, within two months uh, 
okay the initial period is one month plus uh, extension of one month is provided so maximum two months so these things are very sensitive issues and that means we need to focus on resources if we do not have adequate uh, adequate resources in managing the issues that is coming from internal as well as external then this uh, we cannot actually fulfill the organization objective of protecting data privacy of customers right so identifying the different roles the roles can start from analyst then you can have your privacy consultants you can have the legal department supporting the privacy part, uh, privacy uh, team in terms of the contractual requirements, uh, data privacy contracts, and also understanding the legal requirements as well. And uh, then finally, uh, we uh, we have someone as a data privacy manager, and uh, data privacy manager will be reporting to a data protection officer or the relevant terminology which certain organization use. So in short. It, it it can be uh, sort of replicated from information security uh, organization structure as well. Like we see the different people aligned with information security team, a uh, similar structure is also there in data privacy, right? We have a CISO. CISO, uh, CISO has a team within, uh, with, within the structure, which is your information security managers, and also you have information security consultants, and uh, you will also have uh, people within the team assuming different roles managing the poster like your network security your uh, app seg uh, you will also have uh, different people supporting the different requirements of information security similarly is what we have in the privacy organization structure and uh, next important uh, element is conducting privacy awareness workshop this has to uh, has to start with the top management if the top management is not aware about the privacy and the risk associated with it if not managed properly we are gonna uh, once we are uh, once we are done with the privacy awareness workshops in privacy awareness workshop as i said uh, making the uh, organization understand the roles and responsibility of them because every employee has their own roles and responsibility in terms of uh, privacy it's not just the privacy team that needs to be communicated with the organization if they don't understand it then uh, whatever controls we have it's not going to have the benefit that's what i have seen in my personal experience if you don't people if you don't make people accountable for their day to day personal data handling then any any control any sophisticated control we bring in an organization is not going to be effective so that communication that uh, training uh, has to be provided imparted into the organization and that will definitely change the culture of the organization in way we uh, look at personal data right a lot of people still don't understand the value of personal data for example if i go to uh, any organization at a reception i see a lot of personal data collected part of the physical security but we don't really understand what happens to that paper which with with our uh, 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 identity personally identifiable information which is given to them what happens to that paper not many organizations actually take that seriously right so this is where a cultural change is required uh, this is happening in europe at a large scale this will also happen uh, this is going to happen in other countries as well but uh, if you start this early and we can definitely have a lot of positive change with that okay and uh, next important step is in terms of developing a personal data inventory and data flow diagrams and data protection controls uh, once this is done your half of the data privacy task is completed because understanding what data you have in an organization is one of the most important and difficult task as well because the personal data is coming into an organization through multiple channels right one example is i gave is a physical security and you can have data coming from your uh, web it can come from chat <clears throat> it can come from emails it can uh, it can come from so many sources for any organization it depends on the organization business model right so understanding the data flow understanding the channels where you collect the data understanding the data flow within the organization is very very important because the data is moving from one department to another department if you do not have a clear flow of this data you actually cannot fulfill the data privacy obligations one one classical example is a data subject has uh, raised a request to erase his data because the the processing was based on consent 
and now the since the uh, data subject wants to delete his data this data needs to be deleted across the system and which means we are going to have a lot of problem uh, if we do not have a clear data flow uh, of the personal data within the organization right we just cannot go to each and every system at that point of time to trace the data that is how that is why having a clear inventory and data flow mapping very very important these uh, particular topics are going to have lot of value in next 5 to 10 years because there is lot of solutions which are coming up in the market focus, focusing on this particular aspect right if we have a clear inventory half of your headache is taken care that is what i see in every organization right so this is a very challenging part uh, to start with but once you have a clear inventory then uh, you can definitely uh, 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 take care of other parts in much quicker and easier way uh, moving on uh, connecting a data production impact assessment uh, this is mandated if you are especially operating based out of the european union region the terminology of dpia is coined uh, from the gdpr term before that we used to have a terminology called pia which is privacy impact assessment we will see the differences during our course actual course in terms of what is the difference between a pia what is the difference between a dpia what triggers a dpia and how do you actually conduct a dpia so during part of the course we will be uh, happy to help you in a practical way of giving you a dpia template and how do you actually conduct those dpia means uh, i'll show you the results of a dpia as well so which will help you to understand uh, how this is conducted and you can replicate the same in any organization you're taking it up so as i said our course is not just a theoretical course we'll try to bring in all practical aspects of the uh, data privacy program and i'll be helping you with whatever experience i've gained through the course of my tenure and i'll give you those examples from my day to day practical uh, experience which i'm facing okay and uh, we have uh, data subject rights and which we need to manage part of the organization obligation for that we can we need to have a system in place we need to have people resources managing it we need to have slas defined and we need to have ways and means defined in terms of how do we communicate back to the customers and how do we handle that complaints in effective way so all these things are to be uh, fulfilled by the privacy program manager and uh, then the last two important parts which is your data breach management and reporting and uh, which means this is the most critical part uh, any big organization will always have an incident management but that doesn't always fulfill the requirements of your data breach management especially focusing on personal data because the obligation uh, especially if you are operating in european union you have a mandate of 72 hours within 72 hours once you are aware of the breach you need to inform the regulators and if the breach is going to have a high risk on the data subject you need to inform the data subject as well this is a legal requirement so uh, incident management is little different to the data data breach management concerning personal data which you need to properly uh, structure it for any effective data privacy program management and the final step is implementing continuous compliance program and monitoring with metrics now this looks a lot of task isn't it so that is why i said the uh, uh, importance of this particular uh, uh, aspect in an organization is going to grow uh, exponentially from here one person may not be able to fulfill uh, even uh, three to four tasks which is mentioned here that is why we need a dedicated privacy structure and a team so someone will be just focusing on conducting the assessments someone is focused on uh, maintaining the inventory and someone will be focusing on the breach management someone will be developing the policies procedures and uh, looking after the changes and running the uh, uh, running the periodic uh, uh, audits so there is multiple scopes within this entire journey right as a privacy program management uh, manager or a data production officer your role is not to have your hands dirty at each and every task of this but to have a uh, entire accountability for this all these tasks you need to ensure the work to be done and to be done in an effective way but uh, you will not be able to do each and every task uh, which is mentioned here in any organization that's that's 
if it's a very small organization maybe it's possible but in a large organization it's definitely not possible that's why you need to have a clear understanding what a data protection officer can do and that is why we need uh, to always associate data protection officer versus accountability a data protection officer is not going to go reply to a data subject rights but rather he will ensure in a met he is going to uh, uh, review the metrics of how uh, uh, subject data subject rights are responded in a month and review if the if they are meeting the SLA and uh, provide the guidance to the team. That is what is the role of a data, data protection manager as well as data protection officer. OK, so these uh, uh, nuances are very, very important for anyone who's starting this data privacy program manager journey. A lot of questions that was coming yesterday to understand what will be my day to day work. I hope that is the purpose I kept this slide and uh, the reason I explained it in this depth is because uh, I, I wanted you guys to understand and get the flavor of what we do part of our day to day job. And as I said clearly, it's not one man's job. It's entire team which will be focusing on different areas of your uh, data privacy program management. OK. Uh, so I hope you got the flavor of uh, responsibility of privacy program manager as well as uh, uh, data protection officer. Moving on with chapter two. Chapter two is again focusing on the privacy governance. Uh, now the remaining chapter is nothing but dissecting whatever we saw in the roadmap, right? The, the, sec the chapter two is going to focus on the policies procedures, having a dedicated privacy team, okay? And uh, part of this chapter, we will see how to uh, uh, why it's important to have a dedicated vision and mission and having the objective. These things will be derived from the overall organization objective, right? The overall organization objective will drill down into your dead uh, into your dedicated privacy vision and mission statement, right? And having a privacy strategy uh, for the organization customized to the business models and having a, a data privacy framework is very, very important in terms of addressing uh, addressing the privacy concerns in a holistic way. And uh, we also have to def uh, define the privacy team and the model which we are going to use. For example, uh, as I said, uh, if you see on the right hand side, we have different models of privacy governance. One could be a centralized model or second could be or uh, local or decentralized model. There is one more uh, model which is hybrid. Uh, in centralized model, you have one uh, person dictating the entire uh, uh, roles and responsibility, even everything that comes from a single point, and it has been uh, cascaded into the team. And uh, that is how it is like uh, one person deciding at a whole, and it is all being followed by remaining team. That is called centralized model. Uh, this is this is effective uh, uh, sometimes at at, at a larger organization uh, where they feel that uh, having different branches, different enti sub entities taking decisions will create a lot of confusions. So what they do is they have a dedicated function at, at a central level and they decide whatever is the requirements and they just pass the instruction. It has just been followed by remaining all the subgroups. And if we have a local or decentralized, this is a very flat model and uh, and which means a smaller organization is best to adapt these things because uh, it's a flat hierarchy everyone works together and uh, and uh, they interact with each other and it's more like a, a bottom to top approach and uh, this helps uh, in terms of uh, uh, more into a like a agile model where you uh, try to discuss collaborate and make the changes and uh, everyone will have certain uh, uh, certain powers or certain uh, decision making authority so they they fine tune uh, uh, the effectiveness of the privacy program so there is a sort of discretion which is allowed, which is which is there with the responsibility of the people in the team so this is these are the different models uh, which you need to understand and you need to choose the one which is appropriate for your organization. As I said, in data governance, you need to have a vision mission statement which will be drilled down from your organization objectives or organization vision and mission. You'll have a dedicated data privacy policy, uh, roles and responsibility defined and the subsequent process. So this is a sample data privacy framework. 
this again touches most of the areas which we saw in the roadmap. Uh, uh, I'm not going to go into each and every part of it, but uh, if you see these, this is how you come up with the data privacy framework. You create your target operating model, your uh, your program governance, and uh, you also define the different aspects of it. And uh, this is how you ensure there's a holistic uh, view of the data privacy uh, requirements as well as the risk of the organization managed effectively. Okay. And uh, so people who are already in the information security domain, you would have seen such a, a framework for information security. And uh, it's it's almost the same flavor, but uh, the the way we do it is much much different. That is the that is the only that is the only uh, differentiation point. Okay. So structure of the privacy team, uh, the senior management. This could be your uh, board of directors or your CEO. Uh, that could be the senior management. And uh, if for example in 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 GDPR you need a data production officer directly reporting to the board or to the highest uh, uh, management, which could be your senior management, right? He, and he is a C-suit uh, uh, officer cadre. And uh, you cannot make a data privacy officer as same as a MC, uh, chief information security officer. These, these are definitely, you need to have a segregation of duties implemented there. CISO cannot be a data production officer if, there is a requirement of data production officer by law in the GDPR region. I'll, I'll discuss those nuances in detail while we are take up the course because the law says when you are doing certain actions, you need to appoint data production officer as a mandate. In that cases, having a CISO performing a D, uh, data production officer is not acceptable. Okay, and uh, we will also have different functions reporting to the data production office which we have like a, a communication team and uh, we'll also have a team to handle the data subject rights. We'll also have a team focusing on the incident response and we'll also have a dedicated team which is focusing on the controls perspective. And there are uh, support functions, which is the typical internal audit team will also cover the data privacy audits, which will be mandated uh, whenever we have law of the land mandating it or the regulatory requirement or the legal requirement all these things will also will will now start focusing on privacy audits so privacy audits can also come through certifications for example we have iso 27701 so that certification will now uh, will become will become sort of a de facto in the market maybe in next 4 5 years uh, not after 4 5 years for the next 4 5 years it will be very hot because a lot of organizations are certified with 27001 and what they might think is how to how to uh, ensure data privacy, uh, uh, how to give that sense of uh, uh, trust to the customer is that maybe they may go for 27701, right? So then the internal audit department will become uh, an important tool in terms of managing those audits. Obviously, they need to work in collaboration with the data privacy team. And we'll also have the legal team. The legal team works on uh, uh your uh, contractual requirements your uh inferencing the legal requirements whenever you have queries in terms of interpretation of the law all these aspects are handled by the legal department it's always best to have their opinions regarding certain complex issues especially in terms of interpretation of the law or in terms of handling certain specific complex issues like a problem with the customer or a problem with the vendor and what is your legal solution to it? All these things should always be uh, should be consulted with the specific legal department. Okay, so that is all about chapter two, and uh, we are moving into chapter three. And uh, chapter three is about the next aspect, which is privacy program management. In privacy program management, as I said, uh, you need to have a dedicated privacy uh, framework. Uh, sorry, uh, the chapter three is privacy program framework. And uh, part of the framework, very important aspect is to understand the laws and regulations, right? Especially if you are a global organization, being a global organization, you are going to operate in multiple uh, geographies. Understanding the cross-border data transfers is very, very important. What are the applicable international data transfer tools? 
for example if you're operating in gdpr region uh, european region you might have uh, standard contractual clauses scc and you you will have uh, uh, consent as one of the mechanism and you also have adequate st adequacy status which is given by the european commission and uh, you also have uh, certification schemes which also is a instrument to do international data transfers so understanding these aspects part of your privacy framework is very very important documenting them and uh, periodically monitoring the changes with the laws and regulations and uh, informing the concerned team about the role regarding those changes in the laws so this is very important especially if your organization is working on a global scale uh, just an example of uh, so in this chapter we will also look into the uh, uh, gist of different uh, data privacy laws that exist in the world and uh, their essence in the organization uh, but we don't need to memorize each and every aspect of it but we need to have a good understanding and as i as we as i usually say if you understand gdpr uh, uh, to a good extent it's only a matter of inference with any other law this, because 80 percent of the global data privacy laws are the same their uh, differences could be in terms of the, the rights which are available the penalties which are available the principles might slightly change and uh, this is it but 80 percent the crux of any data privacy laws are going to be the same that is why it's very very important understand one uh, 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 law and regulation in complete depth and then you can easily manage the other requirements it's, it's only a matter of inference okay so uh, just for your view if your company is operating in a global level you can see there are multiple laws which you need to incorporate and uh, look after okay as i said if you are doing uh, international data transfer and uh, there are uh, this this slide is focusing on the uh, european union gdpr and as I said, there's an adequacy decision, which is focused on uh, special status given by the European Commission. And with that status, you can uh, go ahead with the international data transfer and also having appropriate safeguards, which includes your standard contractual clauses, approved code of conduct and privacy shield. Right now, privacy shield has been invalidated. And there is a special agreement between the US and the European re region. They are coming up with a new framework. So part of our curriculum, we also discuss on these elements. What are the recent changes which are happening? How do you handle? For example, your company is based out of US and uh, you are working for uh, uh, data privacy requirements, right? You definitely need to know the current changes which is happening within this particular sphere between Europe and uh, US. What are the current changes happening in terms of their uh, uh, instruments to do a data transfer okay and next uh, instrument is binding corporate rules this is a, another important element if you are a global organization and you want to do intra group transfer important word here is intra group it is only within the group you're going to transfer the data but the group is present across the geography for example a uh, uh, indian based company uh, as a uh, as multiple branches across the world but every branch will also be considered as a sub entity and uh, they will they are registered in different countries which means they need to be bounded by that law of the land so in this case what happens is if you have a binding corporate rules uh, which means it allows a intra group uh, data transfer but all these things are referencing to gdpr framework okay i'm just giving one example because if you understand one concept clearly you can then just infer to that particular law of the land okay and exemption uh, exceptions are clearly the uh, you need to get the consent or maybe a contractual obligation to the individual or the vital interest so these are some of the legal basis to do international data transfer and the focusing on gdpr so those those are the elements of your privacy framework especially focusing on the cross-border data transfer so the next chapter is going to be focusing on data assessments so data assessments uh, again is going to be uh, two parts one is your uh, which is mandated by gdpr which is your dpia and if you're operating in different geographies it could be a requirement of pia which is privacy impact assessment and there could be other assessments which is also required part of uh, data privacy management which is your vendor assessments okay 
So a part of these elements, you need to have inventories and records. You need to have uh, ROPA, which is especially uh, a specific requirement, Article 30 of GDPR, which we call records of processing activity, which is called the ROPA, which is nothing but a data flow mapping within an organization. Okay. And uh, so these are assessments part of chapter four. And uh, this is just an overview of TPIA, which is data production impact assessment, which is specifically called out in GDPR. And where we need to do this assessment is whenever any processing activity is going to possess a high risk. In that case, you definitely need to do a DPIA assessment. And uh, GDPR clearly calls out what are the things that needs to be called uh, captured part of DPIA. We have different uh, uh, regulators who are like the ICO Information Commission Office from the UK, and uh, we have AEPD from Spain. Uh, we have different regulators in the uh, GDP uh, in the European region, especially coming with uh, 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 specific templates. How do you conduct a DPIA? or they help you to uh, uh, incorporate the essential elements of DPIA, okay? So we will be uh, looking into these elements in detail whenever we are conducting our sessions. And uh, so just to make it very clear, DPIA... Uh, just to make it very clear, DPIA is always a terminology associated with GDPR. Do not confuse it with PIA. PIA has been long been existing in the uh, data privacy realm, and uh, it is it is there long before uh, GDPR was there. And DPIA is always associated with the uh, GDPR. Okay, and uh, there there are a lot of differences associated with it also because there are certain triggers that calls for DPIA and there are certain triggers that calls for a PIA. During our actual course, we will look into these aspects in detail. I'll also share the templates of how, what are the elements that needs to be captured part of these assessments. And I can also show you a field assessment, which will make you completely understand how do you carry out this activity on your own whenever you take up these roles. Okay, so as I said, this, this entire, uh, course I have uh, we are I'm gonna do in a very practical way not just telling you the theory aspect so this is ROPA records of processing activity uh, records of processing activity is basically you're gonna record every data lifecycle event of personal data right from capturing the uh, collection of data how do you capture it and uh, what was your lawful basis to capture it and uh, what was the purpose for uh, collecting the data? right and what are the categories of personal data you are uh, collecting it and uh, <clears throat> you are also gonna see what are the security measures uh, what are the retention rules applied and uh, if there is a transfer of data to processor or international data transfer are involved in this case so in this case we are gonna look into the recipients who are gonna receive the data all these aspects are uh, uh, important part of the records of processing activity so i can also show you a ropa template part of this course you can you can understand and appreciate it so this will be one of the very important activity we'll be doing part of the data privacy manager role and uh, so very important activity which you need to understand what are the essential elements to be captured part of the records of processing activity this is this is nothing but your data inventory but specifically focused uh, uh, which is coming from the gdpr okay a part of the same activity which is dfd which is data flow diagrams so this is just an inventory of your uh, personal data now you show a personal uh, data flow of the uh, personal data right so this is again just for illustration okay if you see there is a data subject information which is collected through a website there is a collected through retail point of sale phone orders or mail orders and uh, so again this if you are aware of uh, swim, uh, swim lanes uh, how to conduct how to actually construct a data flow this is very similar to that just that we have certain uh, essential elements to be captured part of the personal data flow which is your stages where collection storage or processing 
access or transfer and then archive or destruction so you need to capture them accordingly right uh, part of the processing you collected the data and you are storing the data in the inventory and uh, finally uh, you are uh, sto uh, having the data uh, stored in part of the crms which is your customer relationship management databases uh, and enterprise data warehouse and finally they are uh, uh, transferred to vendors if there is any transaction involved and then you archive and destroy it so this is how you do a data flow diagram for a particular process right and uh, this is there are more multiple tools which are available in the market like one trust security.ai big id a lot of solutions are there which allows you all these are proprietary softwares they are not free to use but uh, these solutions uh, had help you really in terms of uh, having this data flow diagrams okay so this is how you do it and uh, this is required for each and every process for you to complete so with that we complete chapter four and chapter five is about protecting uh, personal information this is the uh, cycle uh, which is protect and here we will be looking one of the very important requirements of data privacy which is privacy by design privacy by uh, data protection by design and default and uh, the information security controls how they supplement data privacy and uh, the technical and organizational measures Part of this, uh, I'm just uh, showcasing you the privacy by design concept. Privacy by design concept was first proposed by Anna Chuakin, and uh, this has seven important principles. This is very, very important for you to understand as a theoretical concept, and then you can use them in your uh, personal data lifecycle in an organization. So we will not be going at the depth of explaining each and every principle here because they take their own time and you need to understand at a, at a, at a, at a concept level what they mean and how you can appreciate that in a uh, implementation of your privacy program in an organization. Okay. And uh, uh, they are very, very important and that is also now mandated in GDPR to invoke privacy by design in, in your privacy program management. And data protection, as I said, uh, security is one of the key enablers of privacy. And uh, so security, when I say security controls, uh, you will have encryption, network security, access control, activity monitoring, breach response, uh, data leakage prevention and then you have your privacy oriented controls which is your discovery and classification access rights uh, access rights consent consent management third party which is vendor management data removal which is your data disposal and policies right and uh, these are uh, uh, very important to understand how security complements privacy you need you cannot uh, implement privacy controls in silo and security will always be associated with data privacy controls because they are always a key enablers to in uh, enablers for data privacy implementation right and uh, so that is where you will uh, uh, understand the correlation and how each team has to complement each other to achieve the end objective which is protecting the customer's data the next chapter is about policies and uh, when we say policies we are going to look into different components of policy because when we say uh, policy a lot of people uh, mistake it data privacy policy can be a section of information security policy but it's actually not you need to have a ded dedicated data privacy policy because there are some specific components within the data privacy policy which you need to address right and uh, when we say data privacy policy we also need uh, need to look into uh, how you uh, address different important questions which is required by the uh, gdpr as a law as well so just showing you a glimpse of what are the things that you generally address what type of personal data do you gather because there are personal data sensitive personal data and there are, there could be criminal records which could be also be handled so all these categories have specific requirements of processing and uh, and why do you gather it the you need to uh, understand the purpose 
are you uh, doing only the purpose which is being defined by you or you uh, doing it in any other un undefined purposes all these things to be captured and you need to clearly define it because this becomes your baseline this is the baseline only all your process and the tools can work do you uh, regularly review the data for accuracy yes you need to uh, ensure the data is accurate you need you give a chance to the data subjects to make the corrections and rectification how do you store it and uh, do you do you retain the data do you store uh, do you store it encrypted or unencrypted way do you store it in a cloud and uh, what are the controls associated with it all these things need to be captured part of your privacy policy how long you keep it retention period and what is what is the retention for each and every uh, aspect of the processing because the retention could vary based on the processing operations uh, there could be legal and regulatory requirements which defines retention for certain activity good example is hr records that needs to be maintained maybe for five to ten years but depends on the country depends on the regulatory requirements right so it did you need to understand those regular uh, retention requirements and then define it in your policies and finally how can you readily comply with the individual's right to access erasure and portability so do you have a system in place do you have a mechanism uh, to address the data subject rights and how do you effectively do it uh, because if you violate data subject rights that's a straightforward penalty under gdpr so again these are some of the important questions that needs to be answered and also uh, these are the components of the data privacy policy which is your privacy policies procedures part of the governance the security controls which is going to protect them uh, the information life cycle management which includes a collection uh, which is uh, your archival your disposal contracts notice inquiries complaints and dispute resolution how do you handle these aspects uh, finally the data handling procedures for department to department so these are some some of the important components on the right hand side i'm just displaying a, a mobile notice so uh, this is a mobile channel for example if you are browsing through your mobile and uh, you are accessing uh, a certain website in this case you need to provide a specific notice and the notice should be in a concise form for example the notice are uh, are different structured there could be a layered notice uh, there could be a dashboard there could also uh, needs to be customized according to the channels for example a mobile a notice should always be structured and layered and it cannot be a lengthy privacy notice isn't it because uh, uh, your your display size has to be taken into account and at the same time you also need to provide the most important aspects of the <clears throat> of the notice in the in the first glimpse right so these are some of the important uh, parameters which you need to uh, take into account while uh, while uh, documenting your privacy policy right and these nuances needs to be uh, uh, to be documented so that it percolates into your design of the system as well as the tools and another important aspect is your employee personal data life cycle because a uh, lot of time we discount the employee personal data uh, we always focus on the customer but employees personal data is also an important aspect because employees uh, are sometimes are not there forever and sometimes an employee leaves an organization they might uh, come back asking the organization to delete the data right so in that case having the data a uh, clear repository of the data and the flow of the data is very very important because a lot of times <laughs> this used to be a lot of uh, incidents where disgruntled employees uh, try, uh, try to raise this particular uh, uh, option with them to erase all the data right so especially when you are handling employee personal data you need to have a clear inventory and uh, we so whenever there is any concern data subject rights we can uh, we can handle it in the right way and this is an example for example someone is applying for a job your cv cover letters and evaluation test results all these things contain personal data during recruiting uh, your marital status contact info family status bank details all these are personal information collected during recruiting workplace access schedules assignments medical exams and your uh, absence record 
and uh, <clears throat> payroll payroll again has your contributions expenses benefits and all these things are personal data personal assessment your training aptitude skills development departure certificates official letters documents and end of contract so lot of personal data is actually spread across different uh, uh, events that happens in an employee life journey so having that uh, in a, a clearly captured so if whenever there is a data subject rights we have to fulfill them as well so just giving you a glimpse of a practical aspect what we do part of the uh, personal data life cycle of an employee the next chapter is monitoring uh, and auditing program performance part of this chapter we look into the data privacy uh, audits and monitoring as I, as i said data privacy audits are going to be the next uh, important thing that's going to come up in the market we see a lot of regulatory audits towards information security especially the certification audits or the legal and uh, or the legal and regulatory requirement uh, if you are if you are operating in middle east you would see the country specific cyber security standard or information security standards and uh, if not you see in india iso 27001 it's one of the de facto or if you are handling payment card you have pci dss if you are handling uh, hipaa if you are uh, part of a health organization uh, operating out of us you have hipaa regulation uh, bank specific uh, regulations are there so audits are going to be there to the eternity right so they they will always exist and uh, there will be one more edition in terms of data privacy audits which going to be coming soon from different regulations especially gdpr is now coming with a certification scheme which means that's going to come up very uh, data privacy audits are going to come up in full fledge right and this can also come up in markets like india when the pdpl comes into effect we will see a lot of data privacy audits come into picture as well right so to do audits you need to have a complete understanding of whatever we discuss so far and we will uh, we will check the requirement from the law reg regulation and the contract and verify whether the organization have fulfilled them right so control maturity assessment data life cycle management data processor review all these are some of the important aspects of the audits and monitoring that organization need to comply uh chapter 8 is a training and awareness this is a good slide which i found in internet uh which is explaining the concepts in a very uh, nice and simple way data minimization collect the minimum data of data what is necessary to achieve the purpose when collecting personal data we often don't need everything right sometimes people just collect for the sake of collecting it and uh, maintaining them is going to be a big trouble because whenever data breach happens and uh, it's been found that you had unnecessary data it's going to it's going to just add the extra count of penalty which you are going to face privacy by design if you are involved in designing products or services think about the ways you can build strong data protection into them data protection must be addressed at the beginning of the design process very 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 important data privacy by design is not a retrofit theory it also it always needs to start whenever you are going to start any data privacy program or data privacy implementation right uh, a good example is if the design is not right the implementation is always going to have a flaw right so that is why privacy by design has to be in uh, incorporated at the beginning of any process uh access and correction uh, always respect the data subjects rights and allow them to make those correction changes or exercise those rights international data transfer very very sensitive in the european union region if you are transferring the data across the globe uh, across your borders be careful in terms of what was your valid instruments to travel and you are respecting the requirements of customers as well as the laws and regulations and uh, these are these are some of the interesting ways just you can make them people aware because it's not just confined to the data privacy team uh, if each and every individual within the organizations are accountable for data privacy this needs to be uh, this needs to be uh, uh, brought in as a cultural change right and uh, chapter 9 is data subject rights uh, very very important for you to understand what are the different rights which are uh, available for 
uh, individuals. It varies from uh, regulation to uh, regulations. And uh, so it's not the same across different countries. Uh, these are the uh, reference coming from GDPR. Uh, right to limit processing, which is, uh, this is more or less right to restriction, right to challenge the legitimacy of processing, which is right to object. Transmission of personal data in structured commonly used is right to portability, right to be evaluated based on automated processing. You, this is right to uh, not uh, uh, right to be put not to put against automated decision making. Uh, and then transparency controller must inform. This is right to information uh, and right to access. Right to know if data is processed. B access this data. So the first one is right to information. The next one is right to access and the right to be forgotten, which is your right to be erased, right to erasure and right to be forgotten. Okay, so we will see the uh, the the nuances of the, for example, all these rights are not absolute. That is another very, very important factor. For example, there are, as I said, the legal requirement always takes a precedence. If I go and ask my company to delete all my data, which means even my HR, uh, HRMS data, uh, the company may not be obliged to do it because they have their own legal requirements coming from the from the law of the land, which mandates them to maintain these records for next five years or 10 years. So you need to understand these aspects that data subject rights may not be absolute in nature. That is where we need to have a consulting uh, process involved. Whenever you are in doubt, please refer to the data protection office or the legal team to understand the intricacies involved. As I said, right to object, right to restriction, all these rights are not absolute at all. You need to uh, see the fa uh, facets of the request. Sometimes there could be a disgruntled employee who making an excessive request. In that case, how do you handle such uh, request? All these things, we will discuss the practical aspects of it during our course, okay? Uh, chapter 10, which is the final chapter uh, of the course, which is the data breach incident management. How do you handle data breach and uh, how what are the difference between your normal information security breach and your data uh, personal data data breach? Because as I said, these, there could be a legal requirement which is coming from uh, European GDPR, which is you have to report within 72 hours. At the same time, whenever there is a risk involved, we need to inform the regulatory authority. And if there is a high risk for the data subject, you need to inform the data subject as well. All these decisions are very, very important because these decisions can be a make or break of the organization. If you do not inform a data subject in time, then the data subject is, is bound to make a lawsuit against the company, which could which could have a devastating effect both in terms of commercial as well as the reputation of the organization. So it is very, very important to have a robust incident management and data breach management uh, practice within the organization. As a data protection manager, you need to data privacy manager, you need to ensure the, the legal and regulatory requirements are incorporated, the, the process is set up, and how do you how do you take up those communication? Because these communications are very sensitive and as I said, these are typically the make or break decisions. If you make a wrong decision here, you could end up having penalty. At the same time, you might uh, risk facing customers' lawsuits and losing the reputation of customers. So, and at the same time, not every incident needs to be reported to customers. Not every incident needs to be reported to the data production authority. So these decisions have those uh, again, intricacy. For example, I, I, I'll, gi I'll always give this classical example. A lot of people uh, 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 fi find it amusing because my data is leaked. Uh, uh, for example, I lose my pen drive and uh, my pen drive had uh, encryption. Okay. And the data is completely encrypted. But uh, how do you handle the situation? This doesn't need to be reported to a data subject because the data is completely encrypted. I don't need to inform the data subject. I already have the controls which is required uh, to protect them. And, and I clearly say there is no high risk involved uh, here in terms of that data affecting my data subject. So these, uh, uh, these nuances we will discuss during the session in terms of how do you handle such incidents and how do you actually draft a incident response plan.
So these are the uh, the course chapters which we will be discussing during our session. And uh, I have completed the course uh, content at a high level, and uh, we will discuss all these topics in depth whenever we 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 join our official sessions. A few interview questions are there, uh, which is like difference between a regulation and directive. Uh, so this was a request that uh, discuss few interview questions. I came up with uh, seven different questions in the previous session as well. Uh, different between a regulation and directive. Regulation means it doesn't need uh, a specific implementation. This is coming from the European Union region. Uh, GDPR is a regulation. We have directives like 1995 directive uh, or um, your uh, e-privacy directive, which will leave the option of implementation to the member state. But regulation is being implemented at a European Union level which does not require any other further implementation uh, uh, modification at a member state level. What type of data lies beyond the scope of GDPR? Anonymous data is completely uh, is not under the scope of GDPR, but pseudonymous data is part of GDPR. That's a clear differentiation. What is layered data privacy notice? Uh, data privacy notice, as I said, can have multiple layers uh, uh, which means the first layer will be just defining what is the purpose of the collection and uh, who is collecting it and uh, what are the controls implemented. So then you can go into other details of retention and all these things. So that is layered privacy notice uh, based on the, uh, it, it is it is in a way defined that people can only read certain amount of information at a point of time. If I show a, a 10 20 to 15 pages notice at the first instance no one is going to read that isn't it that is why layered notice are designed in a way to uh, uh, it's mostly from the thought process of design thinking to make people actually appreciate the concept okay the regulation is gdpr example directives 1995 directive uh, regulations are for uh, implemented at a european union level Okay, they don't need a national implementation uh, me mechanism. Directives are left for the national for the member state to decide the way of implementation. Okay, that is a drawback of 1995 directive. We will discuss all these things in detail when we go into the CIPP course because in CIPP we have a dedicated section one where we discuss the different directives and the GDPR. What were the drawbacks of the directives? That was rectified part of the GDPR, which is the form of a regulation. Okay. Uh, what is the time time limit for complying data access requests? It is uh, one month and uh, it can be extended for uh, based on certain complexity. We need to inform the data subject prior to that. What are the available international data transfer instruments which we discussed, which is the adequacy decision, the uh, additional safeguards, which is your SECs, which is your uh, <coughs> which is your contract, uh, which is your certifications, and we also have binding corporate rules, and uh, these are some of the uh, international data transfer instruments. What is the time limit for informing the authorities about data breach? As I said, 72 hours and what condition data subject needs to be informed whenever the, the risk materializes into high risk for a data subject. That is when you need to inform the data subject. What are the categories of GDPR violation that attracts maximum penalty? There are three to four categories which attracts maximum penalty, which is uh, violating the data privacy principle, violating data subject rights, uh, not obliging with the data production authorities instructions. So these are uh, some of the categories that attracts maximum penalty. The penalty is 4% uh, of annual turn uh, annual global turnover or 20 million euros. This is the highest category. The second category lowest, which is 2% uh, of uh, the annual global turnover or 10 million, whichever is higher. So these are some of the interview questions, which I thought I'll just discuss with you. And apart from that exam roadmap, uh, the course is designed for 32 hours, which will spread across maximum four to five weeks. Uh, depends on the time slot. We generally take three hours uh, for day, which means we cover six hours in a week. So it generally spans around four to five weeks. Uh, then you need to, uh, once you complete the InfoSec train course, you need to start a self-study, which is very, very important because 
the material will cover all the requirements for the session but you need to spend your own time understanding these things again just by reading the official book as well as certain uh, other materials which i will be passing on right and this will require at least two to four weeks because you understand the weak areas during the session there are there are different concepts we are going to discuss someone might be, uh, pick up certain concepts very easily certain concept will be difficult for you to digest so take that two to four weeks to uh, identify your weak areas focus on them and grasp all the concepts fundamentally correct and then the final one or two weeks is for practicing the q a's uh, this is very very important because without doing a q a you will not be prepared for the exam please practice the questions which is there with the iepp 25 questions and uh, with that you will you will de definitely get the confidence that you are ready for the exam and finally the exam day you can just uh, do it a day before based on the availability and you can crack the exam so in short you can definitely crack this exam two months maximum three months for people who are starting afresh okay or starting the domain completely new and they are not from information security background then probably you can take a little more time there is not there is nothing wrong in terms of extending the course to three months or four months before taking the exam because the exam is a bit costly so practice well before giving the exam right and uh, everyone who was taking up the course has very high chances of passing the exam i personally say this not just because i'm the trainer because you are getting not just the concepts uh, but you're also getting the practical aspects as well as the exam training orientation right so you have a very high chance of clearing this exam as well